As we uh, gather together this morning, I'm reminded of uh, a young pastor. He was just getting started in the ministry. He hadn't been a pastor before this. He came to a church, and, and in that church, he discovered some different things. And this one couple they discovered, they only came on special occasions, like they'd come at Christmas, you know, and they'd come at Easter. And, but they were always big talkers. They were always uh, uh, praising Jesus, but uh, they just weren't faithful to the church. And uh, the pastor prayed for them, and encouraged them, of course, and and uh, things just went along. And, and then one day the pastor got a call about the family. He got a call from that uh, that the lady, one of the ladies in the family, one of the young ladies in the family, had taken very terribly sick. He went to the hospital, and there he was with her when the doctor came in and talked to her and the family, and he said, I'm sorry. There's just nothing I can do. This disease is so bad that you'll be dead within a couple of days to weeks. The pastor prayed and encouraged them, and, and uh, as he left that day, he just was heartbroken, of course, and he, uh, he knew that the Lord loved her, and he wanted her to, to know that. As he was leaving, the mother of that family came out in the hall and got him and said, I don't understand what, what's going on here. Doesn't the Bible talk about Jesus healing people? We're going to be looking at it in our scripture today. And uh, as we, I've given you notes this morning for the scripture. And the reason I give notes to people for the scripture, and by the way, the notes I give you are actually my sermon notes. They're what I intend to preach on. God changes it sometimes, and I add extra things and leave things out. But in those notes that you have, I do that because I have found out that when people leave the service, the brain goes dead. And they forget what they heard in the service and said amen about. So I just give you the notes to where you can go home and start reviewing them and say, I remember him talking about that. I know that God spoke to me in that. And that God can use those notes to help you this week review and learn the material found in Luke, the fifth chapter. As we look this morning at, at the, the text in there, I'm reminded back to that time when the pastor looked at the woman and said, yes, Jesus does love you, and Jesus does heal today, and Jesus wants you to be faithful to him. And so the lady looked at the pastor square in the eye, and she said, if Jesus would heal my daughter... I'd be faithful to him forever. I'd be in church every single time the doors are open. I would invite people to come. I would love the Lord. I would bless the ministry of the church. And the pastor prayed for it and encouraged her. And he went away. It was one day later the pastor received a phone call. As he answered the phone call, she was so, t so excited he could hardly understand what she was saying. She says the doctors came in last night and told us that they cannot find any disease in her anymore. That she is so well that, that he sent her to home and he's removed his diagnosis and he said he doesn't understand it, but she is totally well. This is a true story, by the way. The pastor said, that's wonderful. And then his favorite phrase, which is my favorite phrase too, is that I'll see you in church Sunday. Well, you know how that works out. So Sunday morning came, and here she came, and it was an entourage following her. She had every member of her family and extended family with her. They came down, they filled a whole section in the church. They were so excited about this. And when given the opportunity, the pastor said, I see your daughter's feeling better. She said, yes, and I just want to thank God. There's no doubt in my mind that God did the healing, and she is well, and I praise God for this. Well, she made a commitment to the Lord, made a commitment through the pastor to the Lord. She said, you know, if God will heal my daughter, I will go to church every time the doors are open. I'll be faithful to the church service. I'll be uh, involved in the worship of God, and I'll be faithful to him forever. Well, the next Sunday came, and the pastor was wondering, and 
right there through the door. That came that entourage again. They came down and they filled that whole section again. And Pastor thought to himself, it's wonderful to see somebody uh, excited about the Lord and, and excited about what God's doing in their life. And then the next Sunday came by and it was only the couple, just the mom and dad. Even the, the girl that was healed wasn't with them. And after a month, no, none of them were there. They went back to the old habit of showing up on Christmas and showing up on Easter maybe. But they just forgot about what the Lord had done for them. You see, sometimes we are so wanting God to do something in our life that we become like one of those four types of people that are in the church. We take on a pattern in our life to where people can look at us and say, I, I know what type of person you are. You're faithful when God's doing something for you, but you're not faithful to Him when you can't see his hand at work in your life. Now I want you to think with me this morning as we look at four types of people that are in churches today. As we pour into the congregation, there are different types of people. As I shared with the children this morning, and I hid money in that box for one of them to get, and as I took and pointed out that that little box was empty, my dear friend, that's your life. But God gives you a special gift inside your life, inside your box. He gives you a special life and He intends for you to use that gift for Him. You can use it in any other area, but He intends for you to use it for Him. And God wants to speak to you and I this morning about, the, I believe, a very important subject. As we look back in the New Testament when Jesus gone back to the hometown area and He was there and they found out where he was and they came to the house where he was and they crowded into that house and just flooded it. It was people everywhere. There wasn't room to sit. And the scribes and Pharisees, the rulers of the, of the local religion there, they had come down and they were right up front with Jesus. I mean face to face with him. And I want you to look at what happened in that type of worship service in which Jesus was teaching, I want you to think about what God's doing in your life today too. As we go to the Lord in prayer, ask God to speak to you this morning special. Father, thank you for the glory of being able to know you. Thank you for being able to feel the conviction of your work in our life, the sin in our life, and know that we need to get things straightened up. And that we can come to you because in your life, you didn't sin. And you gave us a gift. And that is you knew that we would die for our sins and go to hell. But in your life here on earth, Lord, you took and you went to the cross and paid for my sins and each of our sins and our friends' sins. So that when we die, we can come to heaven with you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for salvation that comes through believing that you love us and that you died for us and that you are God and that you came in flesh to purchase our salvation. Bless us this morning. May we respond this morning at the invitation to accept you and to invite you into our life and to be faithful to you. May we use this time today to, to learn about you more and more and to grow like you in our life. In Jesus' name, amen. It's good to see each of you in services this morning. God bless you. And I hope you do fill in the paperwork. And if you have all the fill in the blanks done, at the end, I'm going to call out a secret sauce that I spilled on one of those papers. And if you have that secret sauce, I'm going to reach in my wallet and I'm going to take out a $5 bill and I'm going to give it to you. And you won't be able to find that secret sauce. People look for it every week. You won't be able to find it. But I'll tell you what it is at the end of the service this morning. And if you have it on your paper, you will get it. It's where I was eating my hamburger, I guess, and dripped some ketchup or something on it. But you won't be able to find it. The four types of people that the Bible shows us are these. Number one, there's helpless people in our church. There's helpers people in our church. There's hindering people in our church. And there are healer people in our church. And I want to think about that first one, that, that helpless. That's what this girl was. She was helpless to get well. The doctors could not do anything to get her well. She was helpless. 
And as we read about it in Luke's Gospel, let's turn to Luke the 5th chapter in verse 17. In Luke's Gospel, verse 17, we will find that, that it's so important that we take and uh, uh, go to God in these things. On one of those days while Jesus was teaching, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, they were sitting there. They had, they'd come from every village of Galilee and Judea and also from Jerusalem. And the Lord's power to heal was in him that day. And just then some men came and they carried on the stretcher a man who was paralyzed. And they tried to bring him into the worship service, but they couldn't because they wanted to sit him down before Jesus. You see, some people just crowd the way and, and new people can't get to the Lord Jesus Christ. And may we never be guilty of that. May we always be the one that uh, encourages others to move forward and encourages others to reach out to Jesus and encourage others to hear what God says. And the disease that this man has was, was incurable. As we read in the story, it had left him completely helpless. He, he couldn't walk. And he had some friends that cared enough about him that they invited him to church. They not only invited him to church, they brought a cot and they carried him to church. They wanted him to hear what they had heard, how the Lord was alive and well. And doubtless the other people had tried to help him, but it didn't work. And, and when we begin to feel this way, we begin to think that there's no hope for me, that, that God's forgotten me and here I am and, and there's no way I can be helped and, and yet there are, we're helpless and yet there are people that are helpers. There are people that help the helpless. And you may know someone like that. There may be somebody in your family. There may be someone in your community. Maybe somebody at your work that is just struggling and going through difficult times and and they feel like they're powerless over their life, and, and you feel that. Well, my dear friend, when you feel that, the reason you feel that is because God is impressing you to tell them there is somebody that really cares even more than you. And your job is to invite them, and your job is to encourage them. You may be one of these evangelist type people that, that you sit down and you say, let me just open the Bible and share with you, and that's wonderful, and, and that's great, and, and I'm that style of person, but, but not all of us are. Some of us are just good encouragers. Some of us are helpers, and we want to help that person in any way God will let us. And one way we can always do that is to invite them to come. There are cards back in the back. You could take have a couple of those little church cards with you and, and just hand it to them and say, I'd like you to come to my church. And, and if you come, I'll make sure that you get a free meal. Now, what you know and they don't know is that you're not going to be paying for it. I am. Because if you bring somebody for the first time here, I pay for their meal. Ladies, I'm paying for your meal today down at Bill Miller's. I hope you'll stay and enjoy it. And that's, that's something that you can use to show your concern and love. And know that you, it's not going to come out of your pocket. It's going to come out of mine. And why do these things count? Why, why is the, the sickness of a flesh allowed to go on in people's life? Why are people beaten down and nobody shows any can care? Well, you can do that. You can show some care. What this man and those around him, and that's a fill in there, those around him uh, knew was that he was in a far worse disease than they thought. They thought he was handicapped, paralyzed, couldn't get up. But that's not the disease that was the worst in his life. And it's not the disease that's the worst in your friend's life. You see, all of us are born into this world and we begin sinning immediately. And the Bible tells us that without coming to Jesus and receiving forgiveness of our sins, we will be cast into hell for eternity. Hell is a real place. Heaven's a real place, but hell is also a real place. And when we die, if we've never received Jesus Christ and made Him the Lord of our life, received the love that He has for us, we're going to be cast into hell. And your friend, my, my favorite person, needs you. Needs you to care enough to invite them. Needs enough for you to let them know there is a solution to the problem they're going through in their life, and we all have them. And that is to come to Jesus and let him change us from the inside out, make us a new person. And that's what those around 
this man thought is that he had a bad disease. Yes, paralyzed. But that wasn't his real bad disease. His real bad is he was lost and did not know Jesus Christ. But they brought him that day and he received Jesus. There are a couple of more scriptures that I'd like to share with you that are found over in Romans. You can look them up yourself and we'll also put them up on the screen. In Romans, the third chapter, we find where it says, It is written, there is no one righteous, not even you, not even one. Look at the next scripture found in Romans 3.23. It says, For all, that's you and me both, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And continue on, look at Titus. And Titus says, He saved us, not by works of righteousness that he had done, but according to his mercy. It's not because you did something for God that he saves you. It's not because you go to church. It's not because you get saved. He saves us, not according to those, but according to his own mercy. You see, God created you uniquely. When you get to heaven and, and spend all those years forever and eternity there walking around and meeting people, you're going to find out something very unique. There will be nobody there like you. Oh, they may look a little like you. Maybe a twin of yours will be there. But my dear friend, they'll be different. And the one thing that God did is He created each one of us individually because He wanted to have a love relationship with every one of us. He wants to bless your life. And so out of mercy and through the washing and the regeneration and the renewal by the Holy Spirit, God saves us. And as we continue over in Ephesians 2, 8, 9, we find out what it means to, to receive. For you are saved by grace. Grace means gift. You're saved as a gift. It's not anything you do. It's through faith. It's through your trusting God. And it's not from yourselves. It's a gift from God. That's what God cares about you. He sees you as helpless to correct your problems. And He sees your friend as helpless to correct theirs. All your advice to them will not get it corrected. And then second, I not only God not only sees helpers in the church and in the world today, but He also sees helpers. Now I hope that's what you are. Since you came to church today, I think you have a, a love relationship with Jesus Christ. I don't know that for certain. You do. I'm not talking about a church membership. I'm talking about you've trusted Jesus. When He died on the cross, pictured in behind me, when He took and went to that cross, He had no sin in His life. He had never sinned. He went there for me. He went there for you. And He paid for our sins so that we were sin-free. When we stand before God in heaven, God will see no sin because Jesus paid for us on that cross. As we look, we see that we find in the church helpers, people that are willing to share in the work of Jesus Christ. Look at uh, the scripture found in Luke 5.18. In Luke the 5th chapter, verse 18, we read these, these lovely words. And it says, Just as some men came carrying on a stretcher a man who was paralyzed, they tried to bring him in and to set him down before them. They tried. And then look over at Mark 2. Mark 2, it says, talking about the same subject, a different writer. Mark 2 says, when he entered Capernaum, that's Jesus entered Capernaum after some days, it was reported that he was at home. And so many people gathered together there. There was no more room in that place where he was, not even in the doorway. And he was speaking the word to them. The word is the Bible. He was teaching the Bible. That's what ought to be done in every church service. Unfortunately, in many church services, the Bible is not even used. If it is, a verse or two is quoted, but it ought to be taught just as it was in Jesus' day. And they came to him bringing a paralytic carried by four of them. This is the same story. It's reported by not only Luke, but also by Mark. Helpers. You heard the story that the day before Eve was created, God and Adam were visiting and talking. God said to Adam, says, Adam, you look like you need a helper. There's a lot of work for you to do here in the Garden of Eden. You look like you need a helper in your life. Somebody can be a good friend to you. Adam thought for only a half a second and said, yes, God, you're right. I do. I need a helper. And God says, well, listen, I think I can help you out with that. He says, uh, 
What if I make a woman for you? And she'll be perfect for you. She'll be beautiful. She'll rub your back at night. She'll rub your feet in the morning. She'll plop grapes in your mouth all the time. She'll prepare your favorite meals without fail. She'll clean up the kitchen and take care of the kids. Adam, you won't have to do anything. Just sit around and be the king of your household. What do you think? Adam thought for a moment and he says, That sounds good, God. That sounds so good. What's it going to cost me? The Lord said, it's going to cost you an arm and a leg. Adam looked shocked and he thought for a second and he said, Lord, what can I get for a rib? What could I get for a rib? Well, God did create Adam and Eve in the garden. And he put them there perfect. And uh, it was so that they could enjoy each other's company and serve Him together in fellowship with God. They walked and talked with Jesus every day in the Garden of Eden. There was no separation like there is today. These men in this passage that I'm reading were struggling because they had gone to a lot of effort to bring this man to Jesus Christ, but they couldn't get him in because of the crowd. And we need to take and put the effort out, no matter how much work it is, to bring people to Jesus. That's a fill-in. And this man had good friends. They were concerned, and they would do almost anything, almost anything, to, even extreme, to help. As we think about this, we see that there are people in the church that are helpless, people in our life that are helpless. We see that there are helpers. There are people that, that care about other people and want to help. And they just need to know what the most important help they can give is. But we also see that, that there are hinderers in the church. You know, there are some people that no matter what you do, they're just going to let down the load and uh, cause you to, to stumble. Look back at verse 18 again. In verse 18 of Luke, uh, the fifth chapter, we read, and he says, Just then some men came in carrying a stretcher, a man who was paralyzed, and they tried to bring him in and set him down before Jesus. But since they could not find a way in because of the crowd, they went up on the roof and they lowered him on the stretcher through the roof and down to the middle of the crowd right before Jesus. The large crowds gathered wherever Jesus went. And it was no exception this day. People just were crowded and the leaders of the church were right down front taking up the this, this space. Right down front. But this new people, they needed to get in too. They brought a friend to see Jesus. And, and it was important that they get priority, but nobody cared. So they took him up on the roof, and they cut a hole open, and they lowered him down right in front of Jesus to where he couldn't miss him. They cared about him, didn't he? Do you care that much about your friends that are going through difficulty? Do you care that, that they don't know how to get out of the trouble they're in? Are you like this woman whose daughter was sick unto death, would be dead in days, weeks at the most? Do you care enough to go like that young pastor did and to say to them, uh, you need to, 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 to look to Jesus for this? And she said, would Jesus heal her? And he said, Jesus does heal. And he prayed for her that day. And that woman said that morning, she said, Pastor, when, if God will heal my daughter, we'll be in church every single service. We'll not miss any services. We'll be there on Sunday. We'll be on Wednesday. We'll even come to movie night on Fridays. We'll be at the ladies' prayer breakfast. We'll be at the, 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 all kinds of different meetings that you have at the church. We'll be faithful and we'll bring our whole family. Well, now past practice showed that that family only showed up on big holidays. But after their daughter was saved, they started coming every single service. But it didn't last. You see, those kind of commitments are not what God's looking for. What He's looking for is you to give your whole life to Him. You to commit your whole life to Him, everything to Him. He doesn't want a piece of you. He doesn't want a commitment from you. He wants your whole life. He wants you to come to Him. You see, people sitting down front in that service in which Jesus was teaching had become a hindrance. That's a fill-in. They'd become a hindrance.
to what Jesus is doing. And you may be, or you don't want to be, but you may have become a hindrance in the life of your neighbor, in the life of your family. They may look at you and say, yeah, you go to church. And you've become a hindrance to them because of things that are going on in your life. Lack of commitment. And you've become a hindrance to people that want to know Jesus and need to know Him, but they don't know how. And they're looking at you and saying, you're not the solution. You can become a hindrance to people. Four types of people in the church. There's helpless people that need help. That may be your family. There are helpers there. That may be you. There are those that just have the skill and the gift and the love and the thoughtfulness and the want to to help people. But there are also hinderers, people that just get in the way. They want to soak it all up themselves. Whether they had come to see Jesus out of curiosity that morning or just to learn uh, how to debate more, they had literally become a hindrance to people coming to Jesus, especially this one man that needed to be there. There are false churches today that are full of self-righteous people, people that that know they're good and and they do all the right thing. They're full of self-righteous people. They're even led by sometimes preachers that that seek only to saddle lost sinners with more more responsibilities and more of this and more of that rather than taking and praying for those people that they will not only come to Jesus, but that their hearts will be sensitive to Him and that they will come to to love Him as much as the preacher loves Him and want them to, to love, to join in and be a part. Sadly, some live a life, although religious, they live a life that doesn't honor Christ and seldom ever, ever supports the work of the church. By their actions, they actually encourage the weak to quit coming or to never come at all. But praise God for the last group I see in the church today, not only helpless and helpers and hinderers, but there are healers. There are those people that that are healers. They love people and they pray for people and encourage them. And they look back at the cross of Jesus and what Jesus, the love that He showed on that cross, how much He loves us and how much He cares about your friend and the difficulties that He's going through. They care. Jesus, of course, would heal many. If there were just those of you and me that cared enough to bring them, to bring those people to Jesus for healing. That's one of your fill-ins. Look at the final verses this morning in our text found in Luke, the 5th chapter, verse 20. And seeing their faith, he said, Friend, your sins are forgiven. Now, I don't remember this man saying, I'm a sinner. I don't remember this man having a sin problem. I remember him being paralyzed. And sometimes we look at the outward things and we get our minds on these things that this is what God needs to fix. When really, it's on the inside what God has to fix. I've known a number of people and stood by the bed of a number of godly people that have gone to be with the Lord. And in each situation, I'm thinking through multiple situations, some very close to me, some that are church members and that I knew well, in every situation that I'm thinking about. One young lady that taught in here, uh, Miss Emily, she taught a ladies' class in there. I remember as I sat by her bed as she was dying and going to have, none of those people wanted healing. None of them. They just were excited to see Jesus. Because they had Jesus that had been with them for so long that they had come to trust Him, whatever He decided, that was enough. Jesus could have taken this paralytic man and just said, your sins have forgiven you. They don't sin anymore. But you see, in this situation, God had planned it to where this man who had sinned and had brought about this paralytic condition in his life needed to be forgiven of his sins so that his health could be restored. Now, listen to me very carefully. I have been down the road of somebody telling me when when my wife was sick, telling me, you know, you just need to pray and ask God what she needs to repent of, what sin she's committed, and to get that sin taken care of. 
That's not what I'm saying at all. That is heresy. But I'm saying that we're all sinners. And I'm saying that when I've seen people die and they've laid on their bedside at the end, the only thing they're concerned about is the fact they're fixing to see Jesus and they're happy about it. Sin is not on their mind. You know why? Because at some point in their life they gave their life to Jesus and they traded their sin into Jesus for salvation in their life. My dear friend, when I die, that's what I want to be thinking about. Not the sins I've committed. I want to be thinking about the Lord Jesus Christ I'm fixing to meet because He's the one that paid for my sins. And when I did that, I went through the waters of baptistry to picture what Jesus had done for me. As they took me through the waters of baptistry, I came in on one side, they took and they, they held my hand up and I raised my hand up and, and I looked in there and I saw that people were looking from all over there and my biggest goal was to tell them what I had done with Jesus. And I gave a testimony. I invited Jesus in my life. And the pastor says, if you died today, would you go to heaven? And I said, yes, because Jesus paid it all. <laughs> when I stand before Jesus, there won't be anything for him to condemn me for. There'll be everything for him to thank me for, for the things I've done after he saved me. He did that. What more could I give him back? And as he lowered me down underneath that water, it was a picture of the fact that I gave up the old life and I had Came to new life as I came up out of the water. It was a life now with Jesus leading me. And, and just as soon as I did, I went up those steps and out of that baptistry following Jesus. And He's still leading my life. My dear friend, He could do the same for you. And in a few moments, I'm going to give an invitation. It's an opportunity for you to leave your seat and to come down front and to say, Pastor, I'm accepting what Jesus has done for me. Just like the man on that bed, I know I have different sicknesses, but my dear friend, I want to tell you, Pastor, I'm coming this morning not about sickness. I'm coming about the fact that I've got a sin that's so much worse, and I'm asking God to forgive it, pay for it, and I'm going to follow in a believer's baptism to show others that I've done exactly that thing. We live in a world today, as we see in chapter 5, verse 21, we live in a world today where we see that going on. The scribes and the Pharisees begin to think to themselves, who is this man who speaks blasphemies? How can he forgive sin? Only God can do that. But perceiving their thought, Jesus replied to them, why are you thinking this in your hearts? What is easier? Your sins have forgiven you? Or to just say, get up and walk? But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he told the paralyzed man, I tell you, get up, take your stretcher, and go home. And immediately he got up before them, picked up what he had been given, what he had been lying on, and he went home and he glorified God. And then everybody was astounded. And they were giving glory to God, and they were filled with awe and said, we have seen incredible things today. Franklin Graham, uh, the son of Billy Graham, the late Billy Graham, died a number of years back. Franklin Graham was a rascal when he was a child. You think of Billy Graham, you think, well, his family had to be perfect. But his son was not. He was a rascal. He did everything wrong you can imagine. He was into all the sins. Franklin Graham talks about that today in a book that he wrote called Rebel with a Cause. It took place when he was so far away from God. He had heard all the stuff from Billy, of course, just like many people in that day did. His name, he met a man named Lester one day. And Lester was a man of faith in God. He trusted God. And uh, he uh, talked to him and he uh, said, Lester said, I want to be a missionary. And uh, you may not know this, but today Franklin Graham, the son of the late Billy Graham, He's not an evangelist that goes out and preaches all the time. He does that. That's not what his goal is. His goal is as a missionary, he takes and helps people that are hurting all over the world with food and all kinds of help and storms and all this. He's a great man of God and, and leads the, the Billy Graham ministry today, which is still going on. And his son, by the way, uh, has become a, an evangelist like Billy was an evangelist. And so 
he's it's still involved in it because of that. And he was talking to this man about his farm, and he said, uh, I, I see you planted seeds out here. He said, yes, I did. He said, uh, I'm visiting the other farmers, and nobody else has planted seeds. Why are you planting seeds? And you planted a lot of seeds. Then you notice that there's no rain and there's no forecast of rain? Haven't you noticed that this is a bad time? You're going to lose all your money and seeds? And the man looked at him. He had a heart of a missionary. He cared about things. And he knew old Billy needed some help. Not Billy. But, uh, Franklin needed some help. And so he told him, he said, this is my story. He said, I walk with Jesus Christ. And he said, the other day Jesus told me, he says, plant the seed now. And he said, I've gotten used to walking with Jesus in this way. When Jesus tells me, and I understand Jesus is telling me to do something, I just do it. It doesn't have to make any sense. So I bought all those seeds, and I planted all of it out there. When I know it's not forecasted to rain, I know that the ground is dry. But he said, I planted all my seeds because he said, I've got a friend over there that I've been witnessing to for some time, trying to get him to give his life to Jesus and to go to church. He's just as hard-headed as some other people, perhaps, probably thinking of Franklin. And he said, I told God, I said, God, are you telling me to plant the seeds so you can give me a crop? And I can tell my friend, you should be listening to Jesus too, and you would have had a crop. And God gave him a piece about planting the seeds, and he did it. Franklin went away that day just frustrated, thinking that man, no farmer at all, he doesn't know the right thing. And that night... Franklin Graham, he was called Rebel Without a Cause for a reason. He was laying on the roof of his house, down there probably where Billy's uh, home was. He was laying on the roof of his house. I don't know if he was playing with his Apple phone or not. I don't think there was one in those days. But he was up there doing something he shouldn't have been doing. And he fell asleep on the roof of his house. And something woke him up, rubbed his face, and fell back asleep. Something woke him up again. He wiped it and he looked. And he looked up. It was raining. It was raining. It was raining. My dear friend, why are you not sharing the gospel with your neighbor? Why are you not living a testimony that, that lets others know that you believe in Jesus and that you're trusting him even with your whole crop? You see, that man knew that when his crop blossomed up and his friend over there says, I didn't plant. Why did you plant? He could say, well, let me tell you about my Jesus. What are you doing? There's four types of people in church. Which type are you? Would you stand together with me as we pray? Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this morning. Thank you for the opportunity, Lord, to be in your house. But, Lord, thank you much more for something else. And that is the conviction you give us, the conviction you give us that we need to be faithful to you in all times, good and bad. Let us not be like the, the family that came right after the event but failed to keep coming because their commitment was not in you as Savior and Lord. Their commitment was in what you had done for them. Lord, help us to remember you did something much more important for us than healing our daughter. You provided salvation so that our daughter and us and our friends could all go to heaven one day, not because of our lives, but because of yours, dying and paying for our sins. I pray this morning that people will come and say, Preacher, I'm trusting Jesus with my life, or I've already trusted Jesus with my life, but I need to get involved in church where I can learn more. And I'm looking for a Bible church that teaches the Bible to where I can go away with more than stories. I can go away with understanding Scripture. Thank you, Lord. Bless us now in this time of invitation. In Jesus' name, amen. Billy, all